Hi, my name is Sunil Yu, and this is a follow-up for a talk that I gave at the RSA conference last year called New Paradigms for the Next Era of Security. Uh, I'll recap that session briefly here, but if I go through it too fast, you might want to um, watch the recording of it um, from on YouTube. So last year, I proposed that we are in this new era of security with a new set of paradigms, and we need new thinking to tackle these problems. Coincidentally, it uh, aligned with the theme of this year's RSA conference. It turns out that this new approach and thinking also helps us achieve a higher degree of resiliency. So before I jump in, I want to point out something that Einstein once said, that we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. Well, to understand the problems and the type of thinking that led to where we are today, we need to look back at a little bit of history. So last year, I, sh I shared this rough timeline chart to show where we've been and where we're heading. And as we look across each decade, we faced a new set of challenges, a different set of challenges each decade, and, re and it required a different type of thinking to tackle that challenge. In the 80s, IT became cheap, um, it became affordable to the masses. So the first problem that we had was that of asset management and trying to understand what, what did we just buy and what business function did it support? Fast forward to the 90s, we saw attacks ramp up. So naturally, we needed ways to defend ourselves against those attacks. In the 2000s, we saw our defenses failing. So we needed new ways to think, uh, to quickly know when um, something bad happened by analyzing logs and setting alarms when an intruder got in. In the 2010s, we learned to assume breach and we had to find ways to get persistent attackers out of our environment. What's interesting is that each of these eras maps nicely into the, into the functions of the NIST cybersecurity framework. Now, I saw this pattern emerge several years ago, and back at RSA 2017, I predicted that if, if this pattern follows its course, then in the 2020s, we're going to face recover-oriented challenges in the form of irreversible destructive attacks that basically undermine our ability to recover. And so in the 2020s, our focus will be on recover, or perhaps we can use the word resiliency. The 2020s is the age of resiliency. Now, in each era, the solutions of the past eras didn't address the challenges of the current era. So naturally, we should expect it, we should expect the need for new solutions and approaches to tackle the new challenges of this present era. But remember the quote uh, that I started off from Einstein, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we use when we created them. Well, we have to look for new ways of thinking to tackle this present era's problems. And so I proposed a new paradigm for the next era of security, and it's what I call the DIE triad. DIE stands for distributed, immutable, and ephemeral. And the DIE triad represents what I believe is the new approach or new thinking that we need to tackle the challenges in this new era. The alternative to the DIE triad or the old way of thinking is the CIA triad, which I'm sure you guys are all uh, pretty familiar with. But let's let's now consider, though, if the CIA triad can actually help us in this new era of resiliency. Remember, we're at the stage of recover now. So you've already been compromised. You've already assumed breach. Let's see what good are our controls around CIA. Your data is already in the hands of the attacker. Well, how do you restore confidentiality? Your systems are all suspect. How do you restore integrity? Your backups have been wiped. Uh, your systems have been ransomware. Um, how do you restore availability? Well, our CIA-centric controls can help us protect, detect, and respond, but we're now at recover, and I would argue the CIA triad is failing us when it comes to understanding how we can tackle the problem of recover. And remember, the failure of controls around CIA is what got us to having to need to recover in the first place. Let's now consider the DIE approach. Your, hands, your, your, your data is in the hands of the attacker, but what if that data were ephemeral, like a credit card number that expires after every use? Uh, your systems are all suspect, but you built it to be immutable using containers. So any change is suspect, and you can blow them all away and uh, redeploy those containers from a known good image easily. And then your backups have been wiped and your systems ransomware. But if you have a distributed environment that can function independently from each other, and that data, and if that data has been encrypted, well, it's ephemeral data. So Again, you don't care that the data has been potentially stolen. And if you do need that data for some reason, it's on an immutable data store, so you can easily revert back to what it was before. Well, it turns out that if we designed towards DIE, then it helps us become resilient against attacks. But not 
strictly by stopping attacks, rather by making attacks irrelevant. And so furthermore, it turns out that if we design towards DIE first, then we lessen our burden towards um, CIA-centric or CIA-oriented controls. Uh, think about it. If I have something that is highly distributed, why do I need to worry about a single system's availability? If I have something that's immutable, why do I need to worry about its integrity? If I have something that's highly ephemeral, why do I need to worry about its confidentiality? In other words, if we can build our assets to DIE, then why do we need to CIA them at all? Now, this might sound sacrilegious to many of us in the security field, but what I'm suggesting is that if we are designing systems to address the recover problem, if we want our systems, if we want to make our systems more resilient, then we should design for DIE first before we design for CIA. Now, I don't think we can fully make all our systems DIE, and so where it falls short, we must build in controls for CIA. But that should be our fallback position. We, you know, we oftentimes advocate for building security in or having a security-focused mindset, uh, security-first sort of mindset. And I'm not suggesting that we stop that, but I'm suggesting that there's a higher priority, that we should first and foremost think about how we can build systems so that it doesn't need security at all. And to make this distinction between CIA and DIE even more vivid, it helps to use an analogy that many cloud native practitioners have already embraced. It's the notion of pets and cattle. And if you're not familiar with it, let me explain it quickly. So pets are things that you give it a name. If they get sick, you take it to the vet and you like giving it hugs. And when we used to think about uh, how we built systems in the past era, we, we built a lot of pets. Our machines had names that we can pronounce, and um, when it had a vulnerability or a problem, we took it to our cyber veterinarians to patch it and make it better. We liked hugging our machines. And things like our personal laptops, our national ID numbers, those are pets. Cattle, on the other hand, you brand it with some obscure name that you can't even pronounce. It's a string of characters and numbers. And then when it gets sick, you basically call it from the herd and you move on. And containers, Lambda functions, and credit card numbers that continuously change are like cattle. When it comes to our pets, we have to CIA them. But when it comes to cattle, we should design them to DIE. And since we care about our pets, we have an obligation to take care of them. So we need to be intentional when it comes to the creation of new pets. That means that the DIE triad, um, may, uh, the, the DIE may change how we think about uh, our roles and responsibilities as it relates to how we handle pets. When, it, when we have to deal with pets, our role is as a cyber veterinarian, and taking care of pets requires lots of uh, tender loving care through CIA-centric controls. But defending these indefensible pets is, is hard enough. Uh, this challenge is exacerbated by just the sheer number of pets that we oftentimes have to deal with. I mean, if you're a pet owner, uh, I'm sure you're, you're doing fine uh, taking care of a few pets in your household. But imagine if you multiplied that by like 10 times and they started like breeding amongst themselves. It, it, would, it would figuratively and literally be like a zoo. So we have to think about our role differently, specifically to avoid uh, unknowingly creating new pets. And, and the operative term here is unknowingly. Um, it's fine if someone wants to create or adopt a new pet. They just have to sign up for the responsibility to care for that pet or at least uh, provide the resources to ensure that it's being properly taken care of. And so I think our role as security professionals will shift from strictly being uh, just a veterinarian to also becoming a pet control officer, ensuring that the, uh, the organization doesn't end up adopting or breeding more pets than it can handle. And if we take the philosophy that we should prioritize DIE over CIA, then that means that our role as a cyber pet control officer should come before our role as a cyber veterinarian. In other words, we should first and foremost encourage the organization to minimize the number of pets. And then secondarily, uh, for the few pets that, that uh, remain, uh, practice the best veterinary care that you can uh, with the limited resources that you have. Now, how do we know what our pets are and what are our cattle? Is there an easy way to distinguish them? Well, here's an asset inventory for a group that I volunteer with called Project N95. Um, I'm sure from the name, you can figure out what we do. And I, I sure hope that one day this project goes away. Um, anyway, using a tool called Jupyter One, we can see that we have nearly 20,000 assets of variant types. But which of these are pets and which are cattle? Um, now, most typically, most of us manually tag assets as being critical. And here, we've noted 24 being deemed critical. 
uh, and this was done manually, but are they really pets? Are they um, are these the only pets that we actually have? Are there potentially more pets than are represented here? And so as I tried to answer that question, I found that it was helpful for look to, to look for measurements that align with the principles of, D, of the DIE triad. Um, for example, let's take ephemerality. So if the goal is to make things more short-lived, then perhaps we can measure how long-lived something is. And it turns out um, this type of data, uh, uptime data, is actually pretty widely available because most organizations that have a CIO have a key performance indicator that is based on uptime. So let's suppose I can get the uptime of every system or component that I have running. I'll end up with a graph that's similar to this. Now, let's suppose I set some arbitrary uh, uptime threshold, meaning anything older than that is a pet, and anything younger than that is basically cattle. Now, having um, many pets might not be desirable either. So, you know, I can essentially what I want to be able to do is set a goal that says, oh, let's try to have fewer pets um, and or shorter lived cattle that moves this curve down and to the left. And so this curve, I would argue, is potentially a good representation of resiliency. Uh, resiliency is, a, is an emergent property, and it's hard to measure directly. But I, I think you can get a good perspective of what is resilient by the shape of this curve. Imagine now there are two types of curves, uh, one that looks like an L, like the, like the letter L, and the other one that looks like the number 7. And I think uh, it would be easy to argue that an organization with uh, a pets versus cattle curve that looks like an L is going to be much more resilient uh, than an organization whose pets, pets and cattle curve looks like a 7. And as I mentioned earlier, we can't measure resiliency directly, but I think the shape of this curve is representative of how a resilient a system might be. But I realize I, it's hard for me to benchmark based on shapes. I, I needed some way to uh, put some kind of number to this curve so I can compare one shape with another. And that's when I realized, you know, this actually looks like a power curve. I, sorry, a power law curve. And so using Excel, I, I put these values, values into a power law curve. And it turns out there's an important value here from the trend line equation that emerges from the resulting scatter plot. It's the exponent that you see here. And for this curve, that value, it's also, it, it's called beta, um, is about 1.4 for these data points. Now, when it comes to measuring robustness and resiliency, there's actually a ton of research that's already been done on this. And here's a paper that talks about the importance of this value in network topologies. Basically, you want this number, this beta, to be less than 2.9 for the system to be fault tolerant. But more interestingly, the lower the beta value, the more resilient, the more resilient it is against intentional attacks. And guess what lowers that beta value? <laughs> more shorter lived cattle okay um, now the there also appears to be a lower bound though that's worth further looking into um, I, I won't go into the math here but apparently when uh, this beta value is less than um, 1.8 things start getting more expensive so the fact that i'm at 1.4 roughly means that maybe this particular environment is more expensive than it potentially could be um, anyway, there's there's some mathematical reason for uh, for this when it comes to network connectivity, but I'm not sure if it applies for something like uptime. You know, perhaps there is a lower bound range that needs to be accounted for when it comes to uptime, but I'm not sure yet. Originally, I thought that just having lots of cattle and as few pets as possible is preferred, um, and this research shows shows that's the case from a resiliency standpoint, but it may not be the case from a uh, business efficiency standpoint. Anyway, I, I think it's going to require some additional research to discover whether these findings from network topologies apply when it comes to measure, measuring resiliency uh, based on ephemerality. But now when it comes to measuring resiliency from network topologies, um, we're measuring a different part of the DIE triad. Uh, specifically, it's, it's a measure of how distributed a network is and whether it can remain connected after the loss of certain nodes and links. As I mentioned earlier, there's a ton of research already being done here, so I won't uh, dive too deep into this. But essentially, we can measure how well uh, distributed and, and connected a network is through well-established graph, uh, graph analysis techniques. And in the case with networks, it's easy to tell uh, what your pets are, usually because they are your uh, most highly connected nodes. The most resilient of these networks is the random network on the left, where there are no hubs, or, or, or rather, where basically there are no pets, and everything is cattle. Um, but 
this is not typically what we see emerge in the natural world. The, the two examples that you see here, one with Facebook and one with Twitter, these are what have uh, emerged naturally. And uh, to me, this reinforces the notion that we will always have some form of pets in real life. I don't think we'll ever get to a state where it's all purely just cattle, even though that's the goal that we would like to try to um, drive towards. Here's another way to measure dye. Um, this is from Will Larson's blog post, uh, for which you can find a link at the bottom of the, of the slide here. Here he talks about giving servers a security grade, and he comes up with this synthetic metric that uh, has the elements of immutability and ephemerality. Uh, we've already talked about the server age when it comes to uptime, but he also captures information on who has root or who has um, SSH access to the server. Basically, he's asking the question, how changeable or how immutable is this server? If you design a container properly, no one has any business uh, logging into it. There's no, there's no need for root access or, or enabling SSH. So the more likely something can be changed, whether by an internal employee through uh, SSH and root, or maybe even through an external entity through the vulnerable libraries, uh, the lower the grade for the server's security. And then here's one more way of measuring DIE, but from an entirely different for an entirely different type of asset, namely software code. Um, here we can look at the the last update stamp uh, timestamp as a form of ephemerality. The more that code changes, the harder it is for attackers to keep up. Uh, the more that code changes, the less value there is in the code itself, at, at least to an attacker. Um, consider the alternative, which is is oftentimes described as software rot or code smell. And, and this can be long-lived code that accrues value to the attacker because the attacker can count on certain flaws and behaviors to remain um, the same. I, I actually experienced this myself. Uh, way back in the day when I used to scrape lots of social media sites, every time that a social media provider changed their interface or added the new features, my scrapers would break. And it was quite frustrating. Uh, but I loved it when my scrapes, uh, when my, um, my scripts uh, would work for months on end because the code never changed. Um, anyway, and I think there's some truth also to the quote that's shown here from Apple, that the security of the products doesn't depend upon the secrecy of the code. Um, we can certainly see that uh, from successful open source companies that that uh, where their business model or their security really doesn't depend upon keeping their code secret. But with respect to uh, source code, I would argue that the real value lies not in the code itself, uh, but in many things that surround it. It's the developers who write the new code where the value resides. It's in the ecosystem that the code runs in. Um, I mean, suppose let's say you had the entire source code for the uh, Apple App Store. Would Apple lose competitive advantage? Not likely, because it takes a lot more than just the code to make the App Store work. Now, like the uptime of a system, the, the less ephemeral or the, long, the longer live code is, the more likely it's, uh, it's um, going to become a pet, accruing more value or importance to the organization. You can see that there are some items here in this list um, that haven't changed in four to five years, like the license terms or the code of conduct. Co uh, code of conduct. Now, my methodology here would suggest that these are likely to be pets and thus need protection, but maybe not necessarily in the traditional CIA um, or security sense, but rather in the form of a, of a cultural or legal standpoint. You, you need to protect the license terms and the code of conduct, uh, the license terms through you know, legal protection and code of conduct through cultural protection. Anyway, lastly, um, all bets are off if you have ephemeral code, but you put non-ephemeral things in it, like secrets and keys. Um, I mean, those really should never be in your source, source code. But if they are, you want to make sure that those uh, uh, secrets and keys are also ephemeral as well. Now, you might be saying, OK, I get the idea behind DIE, uh, but how do I actually implement it? What are some building blocks? Well, fortunately, there are many building blocks out there. And, and here's a bunch of projects that are part of the uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation landscape. We can map them to the attributes of DIE. Um, some, some of these uh, different projects take on one of the attributes, and others take on two or all three. And by the way, I, I might have some of these mappings uh, wrong. So if you have a suggestion for a better mapping or other foundational uh, bricks that I can point out, certainly let me know. I'd love to hear it. And lastly, we want to see how, uh, let's see how it maps to specific types of assets that can be made to DIE. 
uh, the vertical axis here is based on a variation of my cyber defense matrix, where I break out the different asset classes and, and how each of the projects uh, help us achieve D, I, or E for each asset type. And let me just walk through a couple, um, a few examples. Let's say like, for example, uh, Firecracker. Firecracker helps create secure and fast uh, micro VMs, basically ephemeral devices, which are useful for uh, serverless computing. Or MUDB, um, it, it's, it's, immutability is already in the name. It's an immutable database that has the features of being also highly distributed. Uh, things like Intoto and Code Notary, um, they help secure the software supply chain by uh, through immutability by verifying that no hacker has inserted malicious code in between steps uh, for a software update. Sounds like a problem that a green energy company had recently, right? Um, for ephemeral identity, um, the, there's these two companies I pointed out that aren't CNCF projects, but I wanted to include them here because uh, it helps us understand the class of technology that would be in this, in this category. These companies support just-in-time provisioning um, uh, of privileged access to resources. Uh, after you do the work that you need to do, it that access goes away. So it's a highly ephemeral access provisioning. As you can see, there's many boxes that um, um, seem to be blank. And part of that's just um, lack of knowledge on my end. But uh, if you have ideas or thoughts in terms of what else can fill this, uh, I would love to hear it as well. And then here's how some AWS services maps into the DIE triad. Again, I, I might have some of these mappings wrong, so let me know if you disagree with any of the mappings or if, you, if I, I should add anything that's missing. Um, but anyway, just uh, one other consideration is that just having these bricks doesn't mean, that just having these components doesn't mean that we'll have um, the ability to build a defensible wall. Uh, before, we were building with mud, bricks, and straws. Uh, and straw, but now we at least have super strong bricks and we can uh, at least have a fighting chance. But we can still build a pretty crappy wall with super strong bricks. So we need to ensure that we have a we have good design patterns to assemble these bricks properly. And I, I, I've yet to find a consolidated place where we can find these design patterns, but at least we're now cooking with gas and we have an, 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 a way to uh, build more defensible infrastructure. Now, when it comes to cloud infrastructure, I found an interesting pattern with DIE. It seems like the distribution of pets and cattle shift in ways that align with the shared responsibility model. Now, AWS published this model to help us understand um, where AWS has responsibility for security of the cloud and then customers having responsibility for security in the cloud. Since AWS is responsible for security uh, of the cloud, the underlying components that make up the cloud can be seen as cattle by AWS customers, uh, whether it's compute, storage, database, networking, hardware, I mean, even whole regions and availability zones. At, at the macro level, they're all cattle. From the customer standpoint, they're essentially disposable. Um, they manifest the attributes of the DIE triad. However, as we move up the part uh, to the part of the model where the customers are responsible for security, we start seeing more pets. And our goal should be to try to keep them like cattle. Over time, and with tools like uh, cloud security posture management and um, cloud workload protection platform, um, we can start our journey towards higher levels of cloud maturity so that we end up with more cattle in the cloud for, and for the pets that we do have in the uh, cloud, that they're actually secure. And over the longer term, we should continue to make design decisions that aim to have our environment uh, in the cloud be as much as possible all cattle. Uh, again, like I said, I don't think we'll all uh, we'll ever get there because I think we'll always have some pets. But our goal should, uh, but but having such a goal helps us make better design choices when minimizing um, while, while minimizing the burdens that we have um, that we would otherwise have to face if we end up with too many pets. And I think the proportion of pets that we may find uh, could actually reflect the maturity of an organization's uh, journey or adoption of the cloud, where, where fewer and fewer assets resemble pets and look more like cattle instead. And I think it's noteworthy that the customer data sits at the top of this model. Customer data seems to resist being turned into cattle. Uh, but I don't think that will be forever the case because I think there are a number of interesting um, privacy enhancing technologies, uh, which ironically enough has the acronym PET, that allows us to turn customer data from pets into cattle. And, and these tools, um, these privacy enhancing technologies include things like differential privacy, homomorphic encryption, 
uh, secure multi-party computation, trusted execution environments, uh, federated learning. You may have heard all these different things in the past, but now imagine them uh, in, in the context of being able to uh, use these technologies to help you manage your data pets and enable them to be represented as data cattle instead. And I think that this is the future of data security, making data more like cattle so that we don't even need to protect it at all. Uh, we can instead let it DIE. These privacy enhancing technologies, uh, I think, are highly aligned to the DIE principles, and it enables us to treat um, data like cattle. Not implementing DIE for data would then require us to have to essentially CIA those data pets. And over time, um, they become a burden and, in fact, really a punishment when data uh, doesn't align with DIE, the punishment coming through things like GDPR and, and CCPA. Now, DIE done properly, I think, radically changes how the security team relates to the business. And the intersection between the DIE triad and the, and the OODA loop can help us understand why. Now, traditionally, when it comes to um, the relationship between defenders and attackers, the defenders have an OODA loop that is usually oftentimes larger than the attackers. And that's unfortunately because the attackers uh, usually have first mover advantage. However, there is another entity that's able to move faster than the attacker, and that's the business. Unfortunately, um, we, since the security team oftentimes layers on many CIA-oriented restrictions that result in the business OODA loop growing larger than the attackers. In my view, DIE enables us to restore the business OODA loop back to its natural speed. And DIE design patterns enable us to shorten the OODA loop. Now, I think the presence of shadow IT or shadow SaaS is a reflection uh, of the difference in the OODA loop between the business and the CIO and the CISO. Where security is able to embrace DIE, we can um, increase, we can, uh, well, we can decrease this gap between the OODA loops of the business and the, and the uh, CIO CISO and uh, thus find ways to reduce this shadow IT. But it also enables us to uh, increase the gap between the OODA loop of the business and the attacker thereby returning the advantage to the attacker. And I think this is why Ryan McGeehan, who advises a lot of startups um, that uh, generally build cattle in cloud native environments, why Ryan says that uh, large swaths of security risk are simply being eliminated because they're embracing DIE-like concepts. Now, when it comes to the function of recover, some of us, some of us may say, um, you know, in, in the 2020s, we're looking for new solutions, right? Well, in the function of recover, you can argue that we've had technologies like backup um, that helps us recover, and we've had this for a long, long time. But I would argue that backup is an example of an old design pattern. It's an old way of doing recover. And the old approach impedes the business. It doesn't add much business value. Um, this is a situation where it causes the OODA loop of the business to increase. Uh, I believe that the new approach uh, enables us to create business value and, and ultimately adds to the top line. The DIE uh, approach sparks joy. The CIA, uh, CIA approach evokes dread. I mean, no one wants to pay for backup, uh, but people are delighted to be able to see their photos on any device uh, on the, uh, any device that they own. So people are willing to pay for what essentially is backup via iCloud. But the business proposition is uh, to be able to, again, have your photos on any device uh, anytime you want. And people are willing to pay for that. They don't see that as a dread. They don't see that as burdensome. They see that as something that is essential to their lives. And again, it, it sparks joy. I think DIE done properly moves the business towards models that accelerate business and not impede it. So, so to summarize, um, I think the next era in IT and security, we're going to see these uh, irreversible attacks that challenge our ability to recover um, and undermine our ability to recover. Hopefully, I've been able to show you that being able to do more CIA, basically doing protect, detect, and respond, isn't going to address uh, recover scenarios. They're insufficient um, against those scenarios that essentially undermine our ability to recover. So the best countermeasure is really to favor DIE over CIA. And, and the way to do that is to be able to also uh, avoid creating new pets um, that require more CIA, and instead try to promote the creation of cattle that's built to die. And so 
my mantra is death to CIA and long live DIA. So a couple uh, thoughts that I would have for you guys in terms of how you can apply DIE. Some of these are from last year as well, but uh, if you haven't done them last year, well, now's your chance. Um, you should be able to, uh, some of the examples I gave in terms of how you measure DIE, um, these are things that you should be able to do for your own organization. Uh, go and collect them and share them if you're willing to do so. Um, and then create this curve that you saw previously. Then uh, in the next three months, track the movement of that curve. See what causes it to, um, that beta value to shift. Uh, what are the policies? What are the actions that your organization does? Um, what, what, what are the things that your organization does to, um, to cause that uh, curve to move in a particular direction? Um, again, if you want more resiliency, then you want a lower B value, uh, beta value. And as I mentioned earlier, um, we don't really have a great uh, catalog of design patterns uh, with these bricks that with these DIE bricks that we have. We need better design patterns. We need to understand how to uh, assemble these well. And so, um, start now. Start collecting those uh, design patterns. See what works, and again, hopefully, share them with the community writ large. And then, over the longer period, um, find ways to basically discourage pet, uh, pet creation. That will happen naturally on its own if you don't if you don't uh, um, put any controls against it. So just keep that uh, be mindful of when new pets are being created uh, unknowingly, and just be deliberate when you are creating one so that you have the resources to to take care of that pet. And uh, along the way, if you find new ways to uh, avoid pets at all, um, then again discover those, catalog them, and uh, make sure that they become the preferred way for your teams to implement. Uh, some of the systems that they have. And with that, uh, here's how to contact me and if you have any other questions. Thank you very much.